strahlte die Welt so, wie der heutige Tag gestrahlt hat, bräuchten wir uns wenig Sorgen zu machen. Leider ist das Gegenteil der Fall. Nach einer faszinierenden Lecture mit dem amerikanischen Philosophen Michael Sandel vom 21. September, hier selbst dürfen wir wiederum einen sehr prominenten Gast begrüßen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is great to have all of you here again at Zurich University and the Swiss Institute for International Studies in this great hall where Sir Winston Churchill in 1946, as you all know, gave his famous speech, Let Europe Arise. It is an honor and a pleasure to welcome tonight the eminent political thinker, historian and analyst, Nina Khrushcheva. Dear Professor Khrushcheva, we are extremely happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming to beautiful Zurich and fantastic Switzerland. The topic of Professor Khrushcheva's lecture does not need a long explanation. We all live currently under the spell of a war which has already brought doom, death, and damage, especially to the brave people of Ukraine, but more and more also to Russian soldiers who in many cases cannot understand or share the sinister aggressions of their commander-in-chief. Never since World War II, the world has been confronted with such ominous threats and possible catastrophes. The rather unexpected has become all of a sudden, a very brutal reality. And whilst the strong man in the Kremlin is also continuously destroying his own country, he brings huge damage to many parts of the world. Two days ago, the publishing platform Project Syndicate presented an article by Nina Khrushcheva, and in her analysis she writes, I quote, in Putin's Russia, war is peace, slavery is freedom, ignorance is strength, and illegally annexing a sovereign country is fighting colonialism. Indeed. George Orwell's new speak, once again, celebrates a grim counter-reality. Nina Khrushcheva was born in Moscow, studied in the Russian capital, and later went to the United States to write her PhD at Princeton University. She then lectured and worked at Columbia University and the New York University School of Law. Today, she is a professor for international affairs at the New School in New York. And not to forget, she is also a prolific writer on different topics. Recently on Putin's Russia, and just having finished the manuscript on her grandfather, the former first secretary of the Soviet Union's Communist Party and chairman of the Council of Ministers, Nikita Khrushchev. For more mature generations, certainly a most telling name. Again, thanks so much for coming. The floor is entirely yours. Thank you so much. It's an incredible honor and pleasure to be here 
I'm just sort of fascinated by, by the audience and very nervous. Um, and you already took half of my presentation on Orwell and other things. Um, so I decided to speak about trappings of history uh, because it's just one of the subjects. And the reason I chose that topic is because most of the time I'm asked, what is Putin thinking? So I keep sort of trying to get into Putin's head. I've been doing it for 22 years, to be honest with you, although I'm a bit at a loss uh, in the last seven months. Uh, but I'll try. Uh, so Putin's decision to order a full-scale invasion of Ukraine does seem to defy all political logic, uh, even by his own very hardened authoritarian standards and his reasoning. Um, and before, I was always saying, well, let's not, Russia, let's not call Russia a dictatorship because what are you going to do when it becomes a dictatorship? So I was saying, well, it's an autocratic system, it's an authoritarian leadership, but really, uh, in the last seven months, it became clear that he really jo joins the line of tyrants, not least Joseph Stalin, who believed that sustaining his power required constantly expanding it. So this is my first slide. I want to bring to your attention this map. Those, these are the four regions that are being are uh, being annexed uh, last Friday. And uh, uh, I just thought that I would put a little bit of Putin and please pay attention to the audience. So this is his new Politburo. You see, they really do not look happy. So in order to be a dictatorial power, you kind of have to have a dictatorial strength. But clearly, that just doesn't work this way, unfortunately, in this particular case, or so fortunately in this particular case. Uh, so I thought I would just, for some historical comparison, I put it here, because if Stalin thought that sustaining power uh, is expanding it, uh, remember that Mao Zedong famously declared that polit political power grows um, out of the barrel of the gun, or the nuclear missile, as he put it. Uh, and since um, Martin mentioned my grandfather, Nikita Khrushchev, I thought I would just have a little bit of a comparison here. See, I mean, I know he was a communist despot for all of you, and in fact, he was a Stalinist himself, but he still looks a little bit more human uh, in any of these pictures. So when Stalin, when, so when Mao Zedong asked Khrushchev to provide him with uh, recipes for nuclear weapons so he could cold hold his adversaries um, hostage, Khrushchev declined. So I just want to make sure that that was, uh, I know we're going to talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but Khrushchev did decline to give Mao uh, the nuclear weapons. Uh, Putin's barrel of the gun, and for seven months we've been talking about this, uh, is wanting to denazify Ukraine. Uh, and that's where Orwell comes in, because it does not meshing all sorts of realities. And I give it as an example. I mean, it's been once again uh, discussed and rediscussed, but uh, important to remember how dystopian that is, um, uh, sort of that feeling of what's going on. Unfortunately, uh, it's really not fictional as it was in Orwell. Uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, as you know already, is part Jewish. So, yes, there have been some strong Nazi elements in Ukrainian politics, but they are not all Ukrainian politics. But Putin and his idea uh, of um, um, holding the barrel of the gun to Ukraine's head uh, decided that he's going to treat all the elements of Ukrainian politics as, as the Nazi. And so he is now acting, or thinks he's acting, the great liberator, as Russia once was, Soviet Union once was in 19. Uh, 45. One of the perversions of these claims, of course, that the Soviet Union lost 20 million people fighting Adolf Hitler, and at the time the Soviet Union was seen as a defender of Europe. Now, and Martin alluded to this, uh, Russia has turned, Putin has turned into, uh, the, uh, turned his country, my country, our country, into the world's most ruthless threats. Uh, today, I had numerous conversations with various people, and everybody asked, how does it end? I don't know how it ends. 
and that is something that we haven't experienced for quite some time. Um, so that my first slide last week, he held the great uh, grand annexation ceremony of the occupied territories. And uh, um, I'm, I know that some of you, I already spoke with some of you, uh, listened to this accompanying speech to, to the ceremony. And uh, Putin's actual reasons for invading Ukraine uh, clearly seemed or confirmed not being pragmatic or political in any way. It is the politics of grievance, which seems to be the most common, or at least getting more and more common, politics of grievance uh, today. So in that speech, once again, he claimed that Russia stands against the West and American hegemony, that Russia, and that was another very Orwellian part in that speech, so Russia is an empire, we're not going to deny it. Uh, it has 11 time zones, it goes from parts of Germany in used to be Germany, Kaliningrad, Königsberg, uh, all the way to Kapchatka, with, which is bordering Japan. So that's a very, very big country, so an empire. Uh, and in the speech, he claimed that it is a victim of colonialism. Huh? Interesting, right? Uh, and so he needs to act with Ukraine so they would be a just multipolar world. Clearly, I mean, I teach propaganda, I study propaganda, I love propaganda, I do love propaganda, I love a good combination of things that don't get together at all. But I have to say that speech was just even beyond what I could comprehend. I myself is a fan of multipolar world, and not of the opinion that America is always a source of good, something that Putin has been, uh, has been saying. But when I criticize the United States, my criticism is political and I believe that legitimate because we can have different political opinions, his is historic, and that's where all the dangers lie. Because Putin has succumbed to this obsession, that um, uh, kind of unification of what, uh, of what he calls the Russian world. Some of you may recognize this man. This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a uh, Nobel laureate, uh, and uh, who very well known for uh, his very anti-Stalin masterpiece called the Gulag Archipelago, but he's also um, well known, maybe not so much in the West, but certainly in Russia, for his nationalist ideals that he put forward in his 1990 doctrine, 1990 doctrine called Rebuilding, uh, Rebuilding Russia. Uh, the picture on here on, on the right, yes, on, no, on the on your right, right, on your right, uh, is uh, Putin with Solzhenitsyn. Uh, Solzhenitsyn is Putin's idol. Uh, he thinks he really provided with this rebuilding Russia doctrine, he provided Russia with a, uh, with a way forward. Uh, so the, Russia, the, kind of the basis of Russian civilization, building a Russian union, encompassing Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the ethnic Russian areas of Kazakhstan. So, the future is still not now. We still can see all sorts of other things. So that comprises the Russian world. Uh, and for Putin, that is the past that matters, uh, that matters the most. So let me treat you to another map. I love maps. Uh, well, maybe because I live in America and people don't know where the world is, so I always have to show them where things are. Um, so this is actually, but this map you've never seen. This map you've never seen, it kind of, Putin talked about bits of it in his uh, last Friday speech, it seemed like it was forever ago. Uh, so, um, but although this map was put forward uh, early on, even before he announced the invasion, to justify it. So if you could see uh, the, uh, the orange thing in the middle, so originally, this is, uh, this is Ukraine of 1652. So when Putin says, we need to reclaim that land, that's the land he's reclaiming from all the gifts, as they call it, all the gifts from the Russian leaders that Ukraine got. So basically, his argument to Ukraine, get what you were, and we're all going to be good. Um, uh, and so you see the, the gifts of the Russian Tsars, then the gift of Stalin, which is even more insane that you can imagine, because the gift of Stalin, this is the unification, unification 
of uh, West Ukraine and East Ukraine, and West Ukraine used to be Poland, so nobody was giving anything to Ukraine at the time. Stalin took parts of Poland in 1939 uh, after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with, um, uh, with Adolf Hitler. And of course, my favorite is Crimea and Khrushchev because that's how it's being seen. Uh, and everybody talks about Khrushchev giving Crimea to Ukraine, which is also not true um, because Khrushchev was just the secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1954. He was not the head of government. He represented no government positions. And all the Crimea, and Crimea transfer from the Republic of Russia to the Republic of Ukraine within the Soviet Union was done by somebody else. But because Khrushchev denounced Stalin, therefore he's a bad guy in contemporary Putin's Russia, and therefore he must be guilty of the transfer to Ukraine. I just thought you need a little bit this kind of perversion of history here because that is, um, uh, that is kind of an amazing map that Putin bases his actions upon. Um, I mentioned Solzhenitsyn, which is important because it is a theory that uh, Putin em employs is the Solzhenitsyn theory. But uh, also, Solzhenitsyn was a philosopher. I mean, yes, he was a nationalist philosopher, but he was a philosopher. He never would imagine that that idea of uniting Russia, turning into, uh, into this pan-Slavic uh, state, uh, even in his nationalist mania, would, would be uh, losing the sight of basic morality. He wanted to restore historical Russia. Uh, but not through the slaughter of Ukrainians and increasingly more and more Russians in the process. Um, another contradiction here, and uh, I don't know, you, we're in Switzerland, you guys are rational people, uh, we're not. Uh, once again, the country that goes from Kaliningrad to Kamchatka is just cannot be rational. The country that has a double-headed eagle as its symbol, uh, coat of arms, cannot be rational. So it's important to point out contradictions. So another contradiction, as Putin explains, the war in Ukraine is not an expansion of the country, but the preservation of it. And that was that map. So we are preserving our territory. As Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov once explained, Russia is locked, and I quote, in a life and death battle to exist on the world's geopolitical map. So it's not we who threaten you, it's you who threaten us. Uh, and it is a worldview that actually, once again, being represented by another uh, uh, philosopher, another immigrant philosopher, uh, kind of this long-standing obsession with, uh, with historical fairness, with historical justice, as Putin would, would put it. Uh, the philosopher uh, Ivan Ilyin. Uh, Ivan Ilyin fled Europe after the Bolshevik Revolution, and he is known, those who listened to Putin's speech last Friday, he actually spoke about him with great adoration. So he, his works, if you read him, he is truly a militant imperialist. Uh, in fact, unlike Solzhenitsyn, who sort of talk about the unification of Russia hypothetically, described an actual battle between the Eurasian soul, the Russian soul, against the Atlanticist, that is the West, who would want to demean and destroy it. So everybody who follows stories of Putin mentality, that's it. Ilyin hated communism and praised Adolf Hitler for saving Europe from the Red Menace. Huh? When he moved to Switzerland, he moved to Switzerland. He lived here. This is the place called Zolikon, is not far from here. Very nice place, and he, he had a very nice life there, provided us with many wonderful works and crazy philosophies. Uh, and uh, so when he moved there, uh, he was thought to be the agent of Joseph, Joseph Goebbels, as you know, the great father of, of Nazi propaganda. Uh, so Putin, in his annexation speech last week, mentioned Ilyin with adoration, and he also mentioned Goebbels, as you may remember, negatively, in relations to Western sanctions that promote lies about Russia. And when I got to that point of that speech, I was thinking, George Orwell, 2022, war is peace, freedom is slavery, you just cannot beat it. Uh, the problem, though, that Orwell was writing fiction, and I just came from Moscow yesterday, um, and for the last three months that I was there, uh, I was there for three months. 
So this three months, I felt like I'm living in Orwell as reality rather than I am reading that fiction. And that, I have to tell you, is just devastating, a terrifying, uh, terrifying experience. So another thing, I mean, I keep kind of coming back to the contradictions because my title is The Trappings of History. So another trapping at play here is that we know Putin hates revolutions. He blames the West for all this orange, um, uh, what, what are those, uh, orange, what are they, something, something, rose and something other, all these color revolutions. He hates them. He doesn't want those coups to happen to him. So he blames Lenin the main Bolshevik, for giving Ukraine a sense of independence by creating a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. But also, this is incredibly Russian. So only, not only, but in most um, telling way, in most obvious way, in most historic way, only the Russians take a philosophical theory and decide is going to work just like that in reality. Because remember, the Bolsheviks took Karl Marx, the capital, the communist manifesto, and took, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe in other places they read it as theory, but we, in our great 11 time though in Russian way, is going to bring that philosophy into reality. So Putin does the same thing. And that's why ultimately, unless we're all destroyed by then, which I hope we won't, uh, it's going to fail because no philosophy could ever become a basis for a real world. But the reason I talk about this in sort of somewhat detail is because for all these reasons, his actions are so hard to explain and comprehend because this is really not your typical 21st uh, century behavior. So with this historical justification, Russia's assault on Ukraine, uh, uh, Martin mentioned that he only not sacrificed Ukraine in the process, freaked out the whole world, but also really sacrificed the decades of social and economic development uh, in sort of dystopian claims of some grand sovereign future and destroyed the hopes of many Russians to actually have that kind of future. People say, well, it's been 30 years but it's more than that. It's been 50 years when Stalin died and Khrushchev ultimately took over and then denounced Stalin. One of the uh, political exchange programs or any exchange programs began then. They are now being canceled. So it's not just the 30 years after post-communism, after 1991. It's since the 50s. It's since the 60s. Uh, even then, people could travel. People could fly to Europe. I had to fly for, what, 10 hours uh, through different places to get here. So he really has been destroying not only the Russian past, but also half of the Soviet past, of that history, of that history as well. Because all 140 million of Russians uh, are not going to have, for a long time, the actual normal global future because with all these historical claims, he dragged us back into the medieval past. Uh, Russians, about a million more, um, were able... So I just put together a little bit of a Hitler and, and Lenin and, and, you know, things. So you would see how terrifying that, um, that, part, could, uh, that part could be. Um, so, in uh, today, the, the Kremlin said that the information that 700,000 Russians fled since September 21st, when uh, when the Kremlin announced the special military operation, they said it's a fake. Uh, according to many calculations, about a million and a half people fled uh, since the beginning of the operation, probably more, and at least a million fled. Uh, fled in the last, in the last two weeks. Uh, so these people who fled also would have to be, even if they stay wherever they are, uh, wherever they can be, uh, that stain of the Russian invasion, of Russian behaving like the worst brutal force of, of the Middle Ages uh, is something that is going to be with us for a long, long time. 
And this is all the price for Putin's historic sphere of influence and existential battle, existential battle with, the, uh, with the West. Uh, another thing that I want to, um, so this is just a few pictures. I'm sure you've seen them, but these are a few pictures of what people go through to, uh, to get out of that future Russia that Putin says we're all happy to build. Uh, at the beginning of the, this Ukrainian operation, when he announced it on February 24th, there was a very robust anti-war sentiment. In a week, it was completely destroyed. And then there were claims and even reports in the Western press as well that about 70% of, of, uh, of the Russians, the public support for the Kremlin action is there. Uh, but, you know, you ask the question, do you support the military operation or you're going to face 15 years in prison? You're going to say you're going to support the operation. You don't want to have 15 years in prison. But the actual breakdown, uh, and I wish more people talk about this, the 20%, only 20% is fully for, 30% are absolutely fully against, and these are the ones who are trying to flee. And 50% at the beginning said, we will comply and say anything you want if you leave us alone. So with a partial mobilization, Putin, when he, the one he announced, those 50% can no longer ignore the war. And so they're voting, as you see here, with their feet against it, fleeing abroad. So that tells you that that message of united Russia that wants to have justice, historical justice, clearly they don't want to defend that kind of Russia. These are the people going. Um, another question that I'm asked often, uh, in fact today a few people already ask me, so um, why Russians do not protest but, uh, but comply or flee? Uh, only the brave can risk it, because when all opponents of the operation are deemed unpatriotic enemies and the many security branches of the government, and let's remember, Putin is a KGB colonel, so whatever that government is, is run by the KGB. And I use KGB, it's called different now, but it doesn't matter, it's basically a collective term for this. So they immediately and indiscriminately um, um, execute a martial law. Only the official Ministry of Defense information story is allowed and everything else is fake news and a crime public punishable, as I said, for 15 years in prison. Uh, in the last seven months, conservatively, very conservatively, about 20 people, 20, sorry, 20,000 people got detained, many imprisoned or prosecuted, and what's absolutely remarkable, that as it was in Stalin times, never was in Khrushchev times, and even later, works of Russian literature suddenly become a criminal offense. And here is the picture of uh, a man in the Red Square next to Kiev World War Memorial, standing with war and peace, he was immediately detained. Because somebody who was passing by actually called the police and said, this is the man protesting the war. Uh, so all of this is warranted detention. So this, uh, and the other slide is the uh, uh, September 23rd, when people were still trying to protect, protest against the, against the operation. So it works, you can protest, but when, um, kind of when the atmosphere is of complete repression, uh, and we can, and I do compare it to the totality of horror of the Stalin era, um, of the uh, Stalin era big, big purges. Uh, so everybody has to comply. Everybody has to, uh, everybody has to uh, sort of surrender to the system. And of course you can ask me, what about Iran? There are all these great protests are happening there now, well, Iran has been under that kind of system for much longer, and sometimes protests jump up and then they go down. And it doesn't mean that Russia will not protest, but it's still very fresh and very scary. But also, uh, what we also have to remember that it's not just the people who don't know if others are also with them because the whole social media structure, when you can organize a protest, has been completely destroyed. So you don't know if you are in one city in Russia, what about the other city? And so the protests are local, but they cannot really take the whole, uh, the whole society. You need some sort of organization with this. Uh, and the same thing with the elites. I mean, you saw, I'm not gonna go back to the first picture, but you saw that picture. They're 
looking horribly unenthusiastic about this, but that's a KGB system. Uh, so they don't, um, uh, also they will comply rather than rebel, because when the KGB inspired regime reaches this level, and as I said, they're all from the KGB, so this level of oppression, you mistrust everybody. You don't know the man standing next to you when you discuss that Putin needs to be, something needs to happen, I'm not going to say these words, but something needs to happen, whether they, they're going to nod and then they're going to run to him and then the next time you leave the room, you're going to be immediately arrested. So this is, I mean, it's almost a totality of repression. It's not the full totality. It's not totalitarianism, because as I said, I'm there, I'm critical, I write articles. In fact, that article that, that Martin mentioned, uh, it had Putin's suicidal imperialism, and then I said to my editor, maybe we should put Kremlin, because I'm afraid that if I say Putin, it becomes too obvious. What if they arrest me on the border? But if it were a totalitarian system, I would have been, but I'm not. Uh, but still, it's already on that, on, on, on that level. So you're afraid not only the, of the despot on top, but also of the comrade standing next to you. Um, uh, one of the great philosophers of, of uh, uh, not the nationalist, the great philosophers of the Soviet era, Yuri Lotman, once explained that Russian culture is driven by a paradox of tyranny. When a weak state, uh, a state with no liberty, Functions, and uh, functions as a strong state by instilling a controlling government, depriving people of basic freedoms and legal structures, forbidding them to make their own decisions. That's us. So I want to conclude. Putin got out of history all the wrong lessons. The right lesson would have been the Cuban Missile Crisis, this month celebrating its 60th year. Khrushchev, like Putin, also wanted parity with the United States, also wanted, to West, uh, wanted the West to take um, the Soviet interests into account, also, also decided to force the USA hand with p placing rockets into Cuba, thus breaking American hegemony. We can argue that it was reckless, it was not reckless, but let's remember it was resolved in 13 days. We are now in the seventh month of a fear and the fear of the nuclear solution is increasing. When bellicose John Kennedy gave in privately, because Kennedy did promise to take the US missiles out of Turkey, but not publicly, Khrushchev agreed. He got what he wanted, that is, US, uh, that is um, US missiles out of Turkey, and he decided not to escalate further for the sake of humanity. His political reputation suffered, and in 1964, he was ousted. He was ousted, got out of the Kremlin. Putin, by contrast, has been willing to raise the stakes until the bitter end. But I decided, since I am in beautiful, beautiful Zurich, in a wonderful, wonderful country of... wonderful, wonderful country of Switzerland, democracy, I'm going to end on a slightly more optimistic note. You know, I, as a Russian, never feel any optimism. But, for your sake. So, two optimistic de developments in the last few days. Suddenly, Putin said two days ago that he always respected the Ukrainian people, which is interesting because I showed you the map of 60 and 54. And so, for all this time, he's been insisting that Ukrainians are nothing but Russians. So now he's respecting the Ukrainian people. He's clearly losing. And a few days ago, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I quoted Sergei Lavrov, that's his ministry, confirmed that they stand by the January agreement of the five nuclear nations to avoid the nuclear war. So the question of nuclear has been asked, and they finally got off their bellicose rhetoric and decided to say that they want to avoid nuclear war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lina, for this absolutely fascinating lecture, also with insights from... Uh, we stay here. Insights uh, from Moscow, from the Kremlin, from what you know, friends. Uh, you told us you were 
leaving Moscow yesterday, and you had uh, uh, met uh, lots of people, also finished your book about uh, your grandfather. Um, the question is really, what can we do? And the we is highly underdetermined, because who would be this we? Is it the Americans? Is it the Europeans? Is it um, NATO? Is it the Russians? Um, yeah, what's, what's the possibility? We don't know. We don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I, I have to be very honest with you. I don't have this answer. Uh, I do know that when Putin is losing, instead of thinking the, error, the errors of his way, he's actually escalating. He has been escalating so far. This, the last two points that I, that I made uh, on suddenly slightly less bellicose rhetoric may mean something, but it also means nothing, because what we know of Putin today is that he has a very strong idea of that weird historical injustice thing that the West is always trying to undermine Russia, and he's finally going to stand up to this and save humanity. I don't see how he's going to change his mind. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. He has been there for 22 years. Uh, even these people, as you see here, they are not showing much enthusiasm, no. but they are not saying, they are not saying no either. Um, and really, the more and more he has been surrounding himself with loyalists, uh, one of the things, I mean, I know it sounds trite, but I'm sure, I'm, I'm actually convinced that it's true. I mean, everybody went through a horrible time with COVID, whether you had COVID or where you were in, um, I don't know, maybe some of you have large houses, uh, but some people who don't, uh, it was difficult to survive in secluded environment. Putin does have many large houses. Uh, however, he doesn't have people who actually can advise him on this. We know he's paranoid of the end of his rule because all despots are. I mean, Stalin was completely paranoid of everything, and I think he, got, he reached that level of, of, of paranoia. And so during COVID, he was reading history. He's a hobby historian. He likes historical narratives, and of course, he put together the narratives that he liked and not mm. the narratives that he didn't like, mm. like the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Mm. Uh, so um, I think that he's not going, I don't see how he's going to back off. But, but it is possible that um, uh, at least people around him may be able to convince him to delay the possibility of something else. But I don't have good news for you, I really don't, because if he, in the last seven months, he had many opportunities to wear away from that direct road to oblivion that he chose. And he chose not to, mm. even in the last, uh, in the last week, uh, when he signed, when the referendums in those republics took place, and then he uh, sort of signed it and gave a speech, he still had, an, I mean, it was remarkable, he still had an exit. He could have said, you know, guys, let's not do a referendum now. Let's just do whatever that end of the war, and then we'll think about this. But now, of course, President Zelensky came out and said, we're not negotiating with Putin, this is all illegal, and so on and so forth. So he's really closing his own opportunities. Uh, I don't know what the West can do. I actually think that, um, that, I mean, it was a shock, of course, but that very bellicose rhetoric from European capitals of the diplomats in the European capitals actually I'm not saying that was changed Putin behavior, but when Jose Borrell comes out and says we need to do it through negotiations, well, it's the same Jose Borrell that had, Russia needs to lose on a battlefield. So I think that basically nobody is negotiable. That really nobody can negotiate anything. Um, and I, re I don't know. I mean, you know, Switzerland has more sanctions on Russia than any other, uh, than, uh, than um, any other country. I don't know how much, how much you can do. Really? I mean, Is that so? Yes, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And in fact, Russia has been discussing it because uh, when there's some talks about, you know, it's a neutral Switzerland and let's see, how could you be possibly so neutral? We are, we, we are threatened too then, no? 
Well, I think that's what that's the whole perversion of, of that mind of is the that system. of the system is yeah. that everybody who is not saying yes you are becomes a threat to that system. So ultimately sanctions will work, but it may take some time. So it may actually somebody said it today and I want to say it again, which is horrible. It may get worse before it get better, and we don't even know when it get better. Mm. Um, he has an entourage of hardliners too, and two extremely ugly guys. One's name is Ramzan Kadyrov, and he just promoted him to Colonel General. Um, could you imagine that this guy gets more power even, and takes things in his hands, and what would happen to Putin? So there is a, I mean, I, I laugh because Kadyrov for a long time was just allocated to his part, which was a horrible part, uh, um, because he really made a Chechnya, kind of the medieval, once again, a sort of medieval thiefdom. Uh, and so there, and we discussed this, there are a couple of, school of schools of thought. So one school of thought, which I sort of subscribe to, although it says everything contrary to what I say, is that there is still some morsel of rationality in Putin's thinking, which I'm not sure, but perhaps. And so, um, because anything that Kadyrov said so far has been either wrong or dismissed. So when Kadyrov says we need to use small little nuclear weapons to end the war, it's like, well, Kadyrov said that. And anything that he said before was wrong or dismissed. So maybe he's saying that, but they don't actually, he's saying it on purpose and they don't mean it. Uh, and Putin gives him all these uh, promotional ranks just to shut him up, like, go play with your toys. That's fine, goodbye. That's one school of thought. There is, there is still a rational moment. And that's why my whole presentation was about history, because if history is your drive, and medieval history is your drive, mm. how much rational thought you can have. Okay. So another school of thought is that the war is suddenly not going that well in the last month and a half. The military is collapsing. Not only the military itself didn't do well, then the mobilization went horribly wrong. And if the military didn't do what they were supposed to do, imagining that there's 300,000 people uh, who just got mobilized are going to do something better is difficult, possible, because war is unpredictable but difficult. So they're going to announce it, uh, a counter-terrorist oper operation, and then Kadyrov and Prigozhin, he's called Putin's chef, you know, the one who runs all sorts of secret armies in all Wait, over the huh? world, mm. uh, the one who recently was recruiting people from prison uh, to fight that war, they are going to be in charge of this operation then the sky is the limit for them because these people are mercenary armies and as a mercenary army you can do anything you want to do. And in this sense, I know it sounds horrible, I mean basically there's no good solution to any of this. Uh, I'm more afraid of that scenario than the nuclear scenario because the nuclear scenario still may be not getting to and people will stop it. But if there are two mercenaries running around the losing war, they're not going to stop in front of anything. I mean, they're really just going to run with it. So the two, we, we don't know whether he is giving medals to stay away or he's giving medals because he's going to get promoted and the war is going to get worse than it already has been. Horrible. Okay, let's open uh, it to the public here. Please, a question. You've been describing a trajectory of Russian history under Putin that appears to be unavoidable uh, with his involvement of uh, being influenced by Solzhenitsyn, these other nationalist thinkers. I would like to put it this way. We've observed the uh, Transnistria story. We've seen Abkhazia. We've seen then the annexation of Crimea. Couldn't we have changed this trajectory from the West by responding fiercely by these first steps of violating international law, by freezing conflicts, by accepting this? Could have we really changed this trajectory because his thinking evolved over the last yeah. 15 years? No, thank you. I think it's a great question. In fact, when Crimea happened, 
in 2014. I've been, you know, I'm, I'm just teaching, so not that important. But sometimes I speak in various places, and I was going to Vienna a lot, where there's a lot of international organizations, and uh, Geneva, and kind of participating in events. And I kept saying, we need full sanctions. We need blanket sanctions on Russia. Because if, if in 2014, the world has done what it has done now, it wouldn't have been. It really wouldn't have been. Because let's remember that Putin came back in 2012 uh, as a third term, whatever, became president again. So the civil society has not been destroyed. They were still incredible. I mean, remember those protests in 2012? I mean, it was thousands and thousands and thousands of people. By now, it's like the, the example, and I use it's not original, but it's a good, I think it's a useful example. It's like a boiling frog. If you put a frog into boiling water, the frog jumps out and just in shock. But when you heat the water and heat the water and heat the water, and that's what happened since 2014 to now. In eight years, civil society was destroyed, independent media was destroyed, any potential for any political, uh, political force was destroyed. Alexei Navalny was still, you know, in 2020, he was still doing his, uh, his political work. So absolutely, I think it was an amazing mistake to try to normalize Putin's actions then, because people were so fascinated by the fact that little green man took Crimea with no guns, and it's like, oh, maybe it's not that bad because it's no guns and so whatnot. No, I think, I mean, and we've seen it with Angela Merkel, for example. We mm. see it with, uh, with the Pope. Why is he always late for four hours? He's late because he sees how far he can step on your toes and how much of it you can take. Uh, and so, yes, I think it was, but it's one of those things. I mean, history doesn't know conditional tenses. We, we can't say anymore. Next question, please. Thomas Escher, uh, you have a microphone. I actually have two questions, but very short ones. The first one, you mentioned that you have been in Moscow for three months. Were you not afraid that they will contain you there? And the second is, if I remember, you have not mentioned China in your speech. Do you not see any possible influence from Xi on this situation? Thank you. No, I, I mean, um, yeah, I only had that much time and only had to kind of concentrate on, on a certain topic. Um, in Moscow, I am sort of afraid, I think, because they make you afraid. They want you to be afraid. They want people to flee. I don't think it's as scary as people say it is. Uh, if they pick a subject and they want to pursuit that subject, then it becomes scary. Uh, but I have not been that subject, luckily. I don't know why, as I said, not that important. Uh, so, no. But also, you know, using the Khrushchev example, not that Khrushchev was warm and fuzzy uh, in, his, in his time in, um, uh, in power, although he does have a better idea of uh, humanity and kind of liking people more than say, Putin or Stalin did, or actually, for that matter, most of uh, Soviet and Russian leaders. Um, there was a very famous meeting with intelligentsia in the Manege. I mean, those of you who know Russian history or know Moscow a little bit, so there's a Manege, Manege um, uh, exhibition hall. In 62, uh, Khrushchev went to see the avant-garde art. And, you know, Khrushchev was a socialist realist. If you don't know what it is, it's that when things are painted the way they're painted and everything has to have a heroic ending in it. And it's like, you know, the, uh, the factory is booming and all the workers are... The girls are smiling. The girls are smiling and, you know, every Everybody is creating masterpieces of industrialization. Uh, so Khrushchev went to see the avant-garde, and for socialist realist Khrushchev, the avant-garde was something when you know you see Picasso and the eye is here and something is there, and they go, whoa, what is that? Um, and so he was arguing with his artists and saying, well, this is a uh, this is not a uh, self-portrait, this is an ass, said Khrushchev to one artist, to another one who displayed a cosmonaut, an astronaut. Uh, he said, how could it possibly be an astronaut because this is not the body of Gagarin, it's something, something else. Um, and uh, uh, so one of those artists who did the cosmonaut that was, didn't look like a cosmonaut, um, and Khrushchev said, well, if you don't agree with our way of thinking, 
we're going to give you a passport and you're going to get out of the country and serve your Western masters, said Khrushchev. And this artist, great artist, those of you, you know, in case you know a little bit of Russian history, actually when Khrushchev died, he was the one who made a gravestone for him, which is amazing, uh, in the cemetery. And so this artist said, Nikita Sergeyevich is not for you to choose my motherland. And so when I was coming for a day and a half, I was going to Moscow in, in June, I was thinking about this. Vladimir Vladimirovich, it's not for you to choose my motherland. Um, so I'm not going to be afraid until I have to. So let me put it this way. Uh, as for China, yes, China is a very important story. Remember uh, the Olympics and Putin went to CC. It was his first meeting of his first getting out of the country uh, after COVID, after he had his COVID rage syndrome. Uh, and probably talk to see about this. I actually wrote a piece about this for Project Syndicate. If you're curious, you can, uh, you can look it up. Uh, and C probably said, you know what? Sovereignty is important, don't do it. Putin did it anyway, because that's what Putin does. Thinking that, you know, when all the sanctions would happen, China will, is going to bail it out because they have this great relationship. Once again, what really is amazing to me, he's such a bad student of history. He picks history that he likes and completely disregards history he doesn't like. No Russia or Soviet-China relationship ever ends in a peaceful, happy marriage. It just doesn't work. They always want it, and then it doesn't work. And we're already seeing it. It doesn't work because China is already kind of bailing out of a lot of things. They're not doing it loudly. Uh, they're afraid of the secondary sanctions from the United States. Putin is getting anxious and angry, and suddenly the whole China conversation got out of Russian narrative altogether. Because at the beginning it was, oh, Russia is going to, I mean, China is going to save us, all great. Learning bad, bad lessons in history, which once again doesn't really give me a positive outcome of this, but unfortunately, or fortunately for the rest, I think the Russia that we know I don't think it's going to exist in some, maybe not even so distant future. Next question, please. Here. Hello. Um, you see, militarily wise, you can see that um, Russia is bleeding out. Uh, you see the amount, the huge amount of tanks, not just the lives also, but the tanks, the planes, everything, it is losing. And you can start observing that places like uh, uh, Armenia, there they are doing their own thing, and they think, okay, the Russians, they have not anymore the power yeah. to intervene here, the Israelis are doing their thing, and yeah. you can observe everywhere. Don't you think it is a possible scenario that in the future, I mean, nuclear threat right. here or there, yeah. but that people like uh, uh, Lukashenko could even be, be thrown off because he has not any more the protection from Russia and that is going to fall apart. Is this a plausible scenario Absolutely. to think? I mean, I actually, I think that what Putin, which is, you know, in, in, in America we've been, you know, oh, he's so clever, he's done this, he's done that. Anybody who knows Russian history, Russia has never, ever had a good strategist. Just, we don't have those. Tactical victories, yes. Strategic, no. Because it's always some, and that's why I thought it was important to talk about these philosophies that Russians always want to. I'm like, oh, that looks good. Let's just have the Communist Manifesto where everybody had their appraisals, but it's like, ah, you know what? That just seems too much mess, too, too messy and too much trouble. Let's just try something else. But the Russians always go for this. Let's have Christianity on earth, or humanity on earth, or saving something. It's just nuts. Anyway, so that's your strategy at all times. Um, and by starting this, he really put forward things in motion that nobody can predict. And he himself, I mean, he may even, I, I mean, I, I don't know what he's thinking at night, but he may be even thinking, well, I showed them all. I can totally see that. Uh, but, uh, yes, I mean, we see it with Armenia and Azerbaijan. Armenia suddenly, uh, because it was under the Russian protection, sort of, and Armenia said, you know what, Russia, you're not paying attention to us, so we are going to go to the United States. And now the United States is trying to peacemake something between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Guess what? When Putin wakes up, well, I don't know, maybe he, he's too busy with this, but say there was a moment of... of uh, um, uh, 
some, cow, some sort of a lull. And he was like, wait a minute, how America is being engaged in Armenia and Azerbaijan? He was like, well, because you were not paying attention. Uh, so, yes, I think it's really, he just created this new era of warring relationships. Um, because he's afraid that the, um, the, the color revolutions would show others the way. But his own militant stance showed others the way. Uh, and I think it's a really, once again, it's a great danger. Uh, it's a great danger for the world. Please, here. Thank you. If you look at Russian history, 100 years ago, the communists, the Bolsheviks had a system of collecting decision-making, which then was anticipated by Stalin, who turned it into one-man show, a one-man dictatorship, with the consequences they almost lost the war and 20 million people died. Now, your grandfather, when he ended this system, after Stalin's death, he went back to a collective decision-making, understanding that this might be more rational thinking if a couple of people decide things together than just one guy. Now, Putin is basically going back to the previous system of Stalin, and I wonder how long will the Russians allow single people to take power and damage the country? Well, that's what I said, thank you. That's what I said about the how long will Russia allow. I mean, let's remember, it's a very big country. I mean, one of, it's, it's the largest country on earth. So, so I understand that you know, Switzerland is coherent. Russia is incoherent. And one of the reasons it's incoherent, so not one of the reasons, one of the ways to deal with its incoherence, you have the center and sort of you run, you run from the center. Um, Actually, one of the things, I mean, I'm, you know, Khrushchev was, yes, it was a collective government, uh, coll um, uh, co collective authority for some time, but the whole system was vertical. Remember when Putin came in and said, we are going to be, uh, it's going to be vertical, vertical democracy, it's vertical power. He didn't invent it. Every Russian ruling is always vertical because by the time, by 1962, by 1961, Khrushchev was not, was not, there was really a one-man show in many ways. Though true, there was still more, there was a Politburo, there was more sort of a conversation going. They could say, Anastas Mikayan, who was a very famous, uh, one of the very famous Soviet politicians, he lasted from Lenin to Brezhnev, uh, he would argue and others would argue. Gromyko. Uh, Gromyko, well, Gromyko, they were, smaller, Mr. Uh, of, of, right, Mr. Niet. Yes. Uh, but, but generally, I mean, it's a vertical system. The man on top basically makes decisions, I think. But Putin made it to a huge new level. There's not even, if you saw the Security Council meeting on February 21st, that was a one-man show. I mean, even in the Politburo, even in Khrushchev times, there was never anything like that. Mm. I mean, there would still be some sort of a discussion and a conversation. Here he says, and they always, <gasps> and then they all start saying, how wonderful it is. Yeah, let's do it. Oh my God, this is horrible. We're going to die. Oh, let's do it. Uh, so it's, it's one of those amazing things, because even in Stalin, and I actually was saying it to somebody today, uh, that even in Stalin, there was still moments at times where you could convince, if Stalin was in a good mood, uh, that maybe he shouldn't be doing this or that. Uh, another thing that is very important that we didn't have then, and I, I, I can't believe that in the 21st century I'm actually arguing that certain moments of Stalin rule were better than today, which is, it sounds insane, because it was an absolute totalitarian system, and now, as I said, I'm here, and you know, I can speak and whatnot. Still, uh, Stalin was, whatever you say, he was still a political figure. He used KGB, it was Anke, it doesn't matter, they all have these different names since the medieval times, but they're always there Ohrana, to support Ohrana. Ahrana, Aprichnina. Yeah. They were all there to support the system. They're supporting the system. So they were still on top of everybody else, but they were at his service. Putin merged politics and KGB. That never happened. It only happened one time for a year and a half in Soviet history when Yuri Andropov, the former KGB mm -hmm. head, was the head of mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Horrible times. Right. Died in a year and a half. 22 years 
that whole apparatus is KGB apparatus. They run government, they run businesses, they run Gazprom, they run Luke Oil, they run everything. And he is merging politics and KGB. So most of the time, the decisions are not political. The decisions are security and insecurity. Whatever you do for the sake of the state, not the state, sake of the nation, not the sake of the people, for the sake of the state, for the sake of the government, it takes all. And I, th I don't think we've ever been in a situation like that. Next question. Ah, you start, very good, please hear. No, you, you already had your chance. Sorry, there's a lady in the background. <laughs> Next time. Uh, Russian army is huge. If Putin success with his Ukrainian invasion, can he go further to other European countries, especially Baltic one and Poland? I don't think so. Um, but at this point, you can take everything. Um, you can take anything off the table. I don't think. I actually think that when he began all this thing on February 24th, he was really not planning to fight with NATO. Uh, he was not planning to fight with the United States. He just thought that Ukraine is going to get defeated very quickly. Zelensky, being an actor and whatnot, will run away the way Ashraf Ghani did in. Uh, in Afghanistan, and it's all going to be wonderful. They put a puppet government and say, you know, now deal with this. That didn't work out. So ultimately, he started fighting uh, with the whole, essentially, Western, uh, Western world. Uh, I don't think how they will succeed. And also, if they... This is not a prediction. I'm just saying potentially. So if... That is a success, which I don't see how it's going to be. That's the first problem. Then there's still Moldova that they need to take care of. So before they get to Poland, there are other places in the universe that they can take care of. Not a prediction, just saying that, um, that I think it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's a long time coming. But another thing, so there's two positive things that I mentioned, that we love the Ukrainian people, he said, and also that we are uh, devoted to the um, not use of the nuclear weapons. There is another thing. She's not here, but there is, you know, one of the few women in, in the Security Council, Valentina Matvienka, suddenly came out today. Um, uh, she was, you may remember her, because she was the one on February 21st, she was the most shrieking person, saying, <gasps> it's going to be wonderful, let's do this. Mm. Uh, but in an incredibly nervous, sort of high school girl screaming. Hysterical. Almost. Hysterical, almost hysterical. Yeah. Uh, so she came out today and said, we need to start negotiating with Ukraine immediately, let's start today. So clearly there are some already moves. It doesn't mean that Putin is going to buy it and something may come out of it. But we already see that this very, very annoyed public is already thinking, if we are going to lose, how to lose less. Because the reason they were supporting or you know, supporting, but not objecting, is because when Russia seemed to be a clear winner at this, you stick to the winner, especially when everybody else is sanctioning you and everybody's against you and you lost all your money. I think one of the calculations, so in the last seven months, the Russian billionaires lost $75 billion, uh, which is, you know, a lot of money. Uh, and uh, so, then you bet on a winner, because that's how you're going to figure out your next move. But if you're losing, then you have to figure out how to lose less, how you're going to unite and reunite. These are all tiny little morsels. I may be completely wrong, but this is, these are interesting things, because for the last seven months, we didn't see any of this. And now we are seeing this. That may mean something, that may mean nothing. Putin may decide that he's going to arrest all of those who already said something against him, and there's going to be another cycle of violence. I don't know. And I think it's one of those amazing moments in history that we, you, you, you don't really know tomorrow. I mean, you know, I, a week ago, I didn't have my last two lines on a positive note, and now I do. Absolutely. Never was like this for a very long time. Question down there and here. So when we are talking about Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia and Kherson and especially Crimea region, we might say that majority of pro-Ukrainian population left 
but uh, pro-Russian people stayed, and uh, furthermore, uh, people from Russia, Russian people, were placed to live in those region. Uh, so my question is, uh, when Ukraine will fight back its own territories, uh, what should be the first step of Ukrainian government to culturally unite those regions into the whole Ukraine? Well, I mean, I think if Ukraine gets those territories back, I don't think there will be any pro-Russian people left. So I don't think that one needs to worry about this. Uh, but also, I mean, one of the things that this war did is that, you know, there have been certain moments of animosity. Uh, but I was in Kiev in, whatever, I think last time I was there, in 19, 2019. Uh, and nobody would hate me as a Russian. I mean, you know, I'm American, but a Russian. Uh, nobody would hate me as a Russian. Um, but I think for generations now, if ever, that is over. I mean, that is going to be the greatest enemy we've ever had uh, in terms of culture, in terms of, um, in terms of relationship. Uh, and I do hope, I mean, so far, you know, for example, when Ukrainian, and I get it, I mean, they're fighting a horrible war, so it's not even, I'm not even criticizing, crit criticizing them, but I do think if you're clever, you're gonna do it more clever, for example, They've been, uh, they've been forbidding uh, or deleting, you know, the Ukrainian writers or Russian writers who were born in Ukraine and Kiev. Don't do this. Claim them. Say, you know, they're ours and, um, and whatnot. So we'll see. I don't know. When, if peace comes, maybe there will be better decisions and, and, and better, better solutions. Uh, because another fear that I have... Um, is that, you know, this 20%, this nationalist 20% of, of the Russians, they're the loudest people. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're the most population. And so the more they feel they have to stand for their nationality, the crazier they get, and they more, they, the, the more people will try to get into their orbit. For example, Putin's annexation now is a problem for future leaders, because countries don't give up territories that well, even if they, I mean, very few would, but don't really, I mean, they don't. And so for the next leader, if he, he, she, he likely, uh, want to negotiate, they want to negotiate, it would be very difficult because it would be against a certain type of the population. Um, I don't know. I, I really, because I think what we did to Ukrainians is just a horrible thing. I mean, they, they would not forgive us. And I wouldn't blame them. So whatever the decisions are, they're going to treat Russia and Russians as, as enemies. And in, in this sense, I guess, all methods would, would be justifiable, right? And he succeeded even to do that. It's brilliant. Right. Uh, second last question behind. Where? Ah, brilliant. Oh my God. Okay, good. Oh, they never ask questions. It's the first time. It's all because of you. Yeah. Okay, now you don't have a microphone. Go ahead. I will. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm going to repeat it, uh, just to summarize if I could. So we talk about Russia, but there's also China, there's also North Korea, uh, and uh, in sort of this era of many upheavals in many different places, the world has been moving towards uh, more sort of totalitarian formulas, uh, and not just in Russia, and Russia is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, yes, I think, I mean, we've seen Marie Le Pen uh, doing during the French elections better than she ever has. We now have uh, um, a woman in Italy who admired Mussolini, uh, and it's sort of this politics of grievance is also something so, you know, you disregard us and we're going to come back and show you um, how it is. We have uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary. Uh, we have, I mean, Poland now is on the forefront of supporting Ukraine, but let's face it, there are other issues that Poland faces not necessarily always that, uh, that democratic. Um, I, I actually, I mean, I, I had a theory of this uh, early on uh, in the 20th century when everybody was so happy that uh, communism collapsed and it seemed like the era of dictators is over. We're done, that's it. We're end entering of, the 21st. End of history, yeah. Right, it was the end of history. Mm. And then, uh, I was sort of fascinating, the end of history, then they're arguably the most democratic country, so they say, uh, in the world, the United States of America, got George Bush, which is bad, but not as bad as having its vice president, United States, is Dick Cheney. Which essentially kind of an oxymoron democracy in many ways, so, and then democratic system, American democratic system stopped it, but just imagine Cheney in any other system, we would be, Chena Grad, Cheney Stan, a gold statue, and all these other things. Yeah, so I think the world has entered this already in the early 21st century. It doesn't mean that it has to stay this way. It doesn't mean that, and Putin is no, I mean, whatever his claims are, he's not the fighter, he's not the fighter for justice. Something that I've always been saying, and I'll conclude on this, is that democracy should just do better. They have to be better. They should not be hypocritical. No. They should support, if there is a cause that is bad, they have to point out. They should not be looking for winners and losers based on political, uh, po political sympathies or antipathies. So we should do better. You should do better. Europe should do better. And I still hope. My last question is a little bit delicate. Um, there are circles in the West and not so far away who have still a solid understanding of Putin and his policy. Can you explain the psychology of that? Psychology of what, of Putin? Understanding Putin. Well, I just did the whole thing. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, it's a dictatorial system. Uh, so it's all vertical. He's a KGB man, and the KGB man thinks that he needs to stand for the state and the government rather than... But why do they admire him? You know? Oh, why do you admire? I didn't yeah, get that's it. The oh, problem, I'm sorry, you know? I didn't understand that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, people admire strong men. He looks like power. I mean, he's, uh, he appears to be in charge. He's a macho man. I mean, look at uh, uh, Duterte in the Philippines. Look at, um, what's his name, Berlusconi. Uh, look at... Uh, That's the ridiculous version, no? Well, but ridiculous or not, and yet the whole Sardinia still thinks that Berlusconi would have been the greatest thing that happened to humanity, and he's back in power. I mean, what are you asking me about Putin? Oh, my God, I mean, yes. he's, back in, he's back in the government. So we look, we like power. I mean, pe it's a common thing. We like power. We look power looking like power, and Putin should not be looking like power. Let's just face it. He's a five-foot-six saying he's five foot seven. I don't know what it is. He's meter 60, right? Thinking Rather small, something. yes. He's a small man. It doesn't mean that, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really not discriminating against size. I'm just saying that somebody who is five six says he's five seven, that really tells you something. Uh, but we do like power. Sorry. Khrushchev is no hero in Russia because he doesn't look like power. I mean, look at him. He, you know, uh, uh. Uh, Gorbachev doesn't look like power. We don't like them. Brezhnev likes power, looks like power. Stalin looks like power. And Putin was made into looking like power. His nickname in the KGB was the moth. He turned into a tiger. The moth. <laughs>
the moth the head. So okay. behind the curtain. Behind okay, the not fully answered, but we will keep that no, in People like power, mind. I mean, I don't <laughs> yeah, have yeah. a better answer no, no. for you. It, it, I said it's a delicate question okay. also in this country. Yeah. Anyway, okay. so uh, thank you so much. Thank Before you. we proceed to right. presenting a, a gift, I will give you a... <laughs> no, no. Nina, it was stellar. It was a wonderful event. You feel the atmosphere of the audience, audience, and it was an absolutely fantastic opportunity to go to the primary sources of knowledge. And uh, this is always better than some uh, retired general from Germany. Anyway, I don't go into details. And I'm um, fresh from Moscow, <laughs> huh? Yesterday. Okay. Sorry, I take it back. No. Um, <laughs> uh, a short uh, glance at what we are going to do next. Yes, next week already Professor Adam Toos, famous British historian, sees the opportunity and er spricht Deutsch here in this auditorium. Uh, Sergei Shadan from Ukraine, highly interesting. Herfried Münkler, an old friend of ours, political scientist and philosopher. John Elkan, chairman of Stellantis Ferrania Excor, is about sustainability in a highly complicated world, also with all the problems of energy. Please, next. So, then we have the Frank Schirmacher Foundation Award, and this is going online because, as you know, Ayan is still under the fatwa, and when we know what happened recently to Salman Rushdie, unfortunately, we cannot present her here in public, but it is a live uh, thing, uh, from a secret studio will be very interesting. In cooperation with the Literaturhaus Zürich, two events, uh, Professor Helmut Leighton with his new book, and the writer and publisher Michael Krüger, both um, interviewed by uh, myself. So again, Adam Toos, here he is. He looks fresh, inspired. You really have to come, this is also fantastic. So, now, okay, it's always really difficult to find the proper gift. And of course, we have more pragmatic gifts, like huge boxes of chocolate, or a cheese, or a, a, a panorama knife with all the mountains engraved of Switzerland. It's very nice, too. Okay. And, um, you make me jealous. Yeah, and then we also have symbolic gifts. Okay, and I thought the two of us, as we get along so wonderfully, should somehow also having uh, fitting colors. Oh, wow. You know, here is blue and yellow, and here is blue and yellow, and if you look, you see yourself in this scarf. Oh it's God. Swiss quality. Fall is here. It's getting cold, not only in Switzerland, even in Moscow. I'm not sure I if this allowed there. This yeah, could be a problem. But um, in New York, I will wear it. In here. New York. And again, Nina, this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Ukraine.